All right, uh, so let's get started with the last lecture of the quarter. Um, so we're talking about statistical mechanics, and the last topic I want to talk about is introducing the, the Boltzmann, uh, Boltzmann probability distribution. So uh, this is discussed in section 9.3 of, of Harris's textbook. Um, Boltzmann distribution. So last time we were talking about, you know, we, we talked about the Schrodinger equation. We have some stationary states in any quantum system. They have some energies. And then the notion was that the temperature plays a role in how these energy levels are occupied. So the idea is at zero temperature, we expect to go to the lowest energy eigenstate that's a ground state and if you raise the temperature you know there's going to be some kind of statistical mixture so you with different probabilities uh, you can find different different energies so Boltzmann distribution is something that uh, basically gives us these probabilities and relates them to the temperature so the higher the temperature you have a higher probability of occupying higher energy levels uh, so, so the book starts with a very neat example. It's a toy model, but let's let's start playing with it. So, toy model. So, consider one quantum harmonic oscillator. So, a one D harmonic oscillator that we discussed earlier in the course, and we know that the energy of each level. is e n is n plus a half times h bar omega naught right so you have a harmonic oscillator with frequency omega naught those are the the energy levels now imagine uh, we have n oscillators So you have a, a whole bunch of these oscillators and each of them, you know, has these energy levels. So the system, you know, each of them can be in some energy eigenstate, you know, one a given, let's say, eigenstate for this multi-oscillator system, well, maybe has this one in the ground state, this one in the first, second, third excited state, this one in the second excited state, etc. And then there's some total energy associated with this system of many oscillators. So we have n oscillators. Uh, for simplicity, let's drop this constant in the energy. That just changes... Uh, changes the total energy by some constant so it's it's just a, it's just a little bit annoying to carry it around it's just a constant shift so drop the constant in energy with this kind of new origin of energy we can identify e and i to be ni h bar omega naught, and ni can be 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. i can be 1 to n, if I have n of these oscillators. So in this case, capital N is 3. Let's say this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. So i equal 1, i equal 2, i equal 3. So in this particular example, n1 is... 0, 1, 2, 3, n2 is 0, 1, 2, and n3 is 0. Now, the total energy uh, of the system, so total energy is going to be the sum of those energies, right? Let me write it as E, which is going to be, let's say, n1 times h bar omega naught plus n2 times h bar omega naught up to n n 
times h bar omega naught. Writing it as a sum in a more compact notation, you can write it as sum over i equal 1 to capital n, the number of oscillators, <coughs> ni, which is kind of the number of excitations in oscillator i times h bar omega naught. And then this is going to be some integer, right, times h bar omega naught. You factor out h bar omega naught, it's sum of some integers, and the sum of some integers is an integer. So m is simply defined as sum over i equal 1 to n of n i. Right, so the larger the, the capital N, you have a larger total energy in your system. Now, last time we talked about kind of these microstates having the same probability. So if you want to think about the probability of, uh, of having, of Ni taking some particular value, well, how, how are we going to think about it, right? So suppose, um, yeah, suppose I want to have, um, I want to have, let's say, my oscillator i, I want it to have an energy that's ni times h bar omega, right, for one of these oscillators. What is that probability? Well, uh, I have to think about the number of ways, right? I can have different configurations such that the total energy is capital M times H bar omega, right? And oscillator I has N I excitations divided by the total number of ways of just having uh, total energy M. So for example, if total energy, let's say M is equal three in this case, I have several ways, right? Maybe oscillator one has three and then two, and these guys have zero excitations. If this one has two, then maybe one of them is one, the other is zero, so we have two ways. If this one has a one, then we have, again, different possibilities for the other oscillator. So, so it's like, think about, like you have a total number of excitations, that's a capital M, and there are multiple ways of uh, kind of distributing them between the different oscillators, right? So we can count that, that's the total number of ways. And then we can restrict the, the number of excitations of one of the oscillators to a particular value and count the total number of configurations with that constraint. So, um, so let's write it in words. So P and I, the probability of oscillator I having N I excitations is gonna be the number of ways of distributing energy with fixed an i divided uh, by the total number of ways of distributing the energy. And this total energy is, of course, capital M times H bar omega. Okay, so let's think about the number of ways I can, um, I can distribute this total energy that's capital M times H bar omega into these capital N oscillators. Well, it's going to be like the number of ways you can write n integers that add up to m, right? So this is 
n integers adding up to m. Let's do an example. So suppose I don't know n is 2 and m is 4. Okay. So how can I write uh, two integers that add up to 4? Well, I can have n1 plus n2 is equal to 4. So the first one can be uh, 0, the next one 4, can be 1, 3, can be 2, 2, can be 3, 1, and can be 4, 0, right? You either put all the excitations here, or 1 there, 3 there, 2 in each, 3 here, 1 there, etc. Okay? So let's do another example. What, what if n is equal 3, for example, and m equal 4? So I have n1 plus n2 plus n3 is equal to 4, right? So what are my choices? Well, I can have n equal n1 equal 0, and then n2 plus n3 must be 4. So I'm going to have, you know, in this case, if the total is 2, right, I'm going to have n plus 1 choices, right, because it runs from 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n. So I will get for n2 and n3, I get, um, so here I have 5 choices. I get 5 choices. Then I can have n1 equal 1, and now I get 4 choices for n2 and n3, because n2 and n3 must be equal to 3, then the first one can run from, for example, 0 to, to 3. And 1 can be 2. I have 3 choices in this case. And 1 can be 3. I have 2 choices. And 1 can be 4. Um, and I have 1 choice, right? If n1 is 4, both n2 and n3 must be 0, so that's 1 choice. You add them up, let's see, 5 plus 4 plus 3, uh, that's 12, plus 2 plus 1 is 15 choices, for example. So how can we count this number kind of in a more general way? So we can make use of the number of permutations that, that we talked about before, right? So imagine, you know, uh, so... For example, this picture, let, let me pick one particular example. For example, n1 equal 1, n2 equal 3, n3 equal 1. Okay, so can imagine I have one ball here, 3 there, that's for the next one for n2, and another ball here, one of them here. So that's the geometric representation of this. So basically the total number of these balls must be m, right? And and they're distrib if they if they're kind of partitions into n, so n is 3 in this case, I, I will have two partitions, right? Okay, so uh, so again, we can think about the number of of kind of constructing these integers. So suppose I have x is the number of n integers adding up to m the thing I want to calculate, which is, in this case, for example, is 5, in this case, it's 15. Okay, so then I can calculate the number of permutations of, of all of these objects, the, the balls and the partitions, two different ways, right? One is I just say, well, the, the sum is, I have here, I have n minus 1 partitions, I have m balls in total. So 
the total number of permutations, the number of arranging them, is going to be n minus 1 plus m factorial. But then I can count it a different way. I can pick each of these configurations, so how they're partitioned, for example, this has a 1, 3, 1 configuration, and then I say, well, now, for each of these, the number of different permutations is, well, I have to permute the partitions, so that's an n minus 1 factorial, and then I can uh, kind of permute those, those balls in n minus 1 factorial, in n factorial ways. So I can write this, I can write it as x, the number of these partitions, times n minus 1 factorial, times m factorial. Therefore, if you divide it, x just becomes um, x becomes n minus 1 plus m factorial, n minus 1 factorial, m factorial. So it's really the number of choosing m out of m plus n minus 1. Another way to think about it is one of each of these configurations is if you think of the balls and the partitions as different like places, the number of these configurations is which you know, which of them, which of these different places, this n minus 1 plus n places, I choose to be my partitions, right? So that's, for example, the number of choosing uh, m out of m plus n minus 1, which is the same as the number of choosing n minus 1 out of m plus n minus 1. Okay, so now that we, we have this combinatorial result, so let's check that it works. So this, in this case, must be the number of ways of choosing 4 out of 4 plus 3 minus 1. 4 plus 3 minus 1. Does it work? So 4 plus 3 minus 1 is, is uh, 6, right? So this is going to be... 6 factorial over 4 factorial is 6 times 5, and then I have to divide by 2 factorial, 6 minus 4 is 2, so that's 30 divided by 2, that's 15, it works. Okay, so, so we did this counting, so basically what I want to do is, I want to count the number of ways of distributing that energy, uh, m h bar omega naught, uh, with fixed n i divided by the total number. So we calculated the total number. Uh, so that's going to be m plus n minus 1 choosing m. Now, the other problem is not more difficult, right? So if one of the oscillators has n i excitations in it, it means uh, so, if oscillator i has n i excitations, um, then we have m minus n i excitations, those are the remaining ones if the total number of excitations is capital M, in n minus 1 oscillators, right? So all the other oscillators out of the capital N, uh, there's n minus 1 of them, they have this many excitations. So it's just now replacing m minus n i for m and n minus 1 for n. So this is going to become m minus n i plus n minus 1 minus 1, right? And m becomes again n minus n i. So for this particular model, uh, that's 
that's the probability of oscillator I having NI excitations if you have capital N oscillators and the total number of excitations in these capital N oscillators is uh, capital N. Okay. Now, uh, we can try to get a little bit of intuition about this kind of numerically. Uh, so, so let's think about that. And, and one comment I should make is that, of course, the larger this capital M, the higher energy of the system, the higher average energy of the system. Right, so you kind of expect that to correspond to a higher temperature. All right, so I've pulled up MATLAB. It's a, it's a software for simple kind of numerical computation. So, um, so let's do a bit of a numerical experiment with this. So I'm going to pick um, n equal 50 and n equal 10. Okay, so let's do that. So n is 10, m is 50, right? So I have 50 excitations in 10 oscillators. That's one particular example. And then, of course, ni, right, the number of excitations in one of these oscillators can be anything from, you know, 0 or, let's say, yeah, it can be anything from 0 to 50. So let's forget about 0. Let's do it for, for n equal 1 to n equal 50. Okay, so I want to calculate the probability we just calculated and see what they look like as a function of mi. So I can do 4ni equal 1 to 1 to m, right? So it can be 1 to 50. Let's say p of ni. is going to be the number of ways. So MATLAB has a built-in function for it called n choose k of choosing um, n minus ni out of m minus ni plus n minus one minus one. So let me write it m minus ni minus ni plus n minus 1, minus 1, capital N minus n i, right? That's the numerator, and that's divided by, again, the number of ways of choosing uh, m out of m plus n minus 1. So I choose m out of m plus n minus 1. I choose m minus n i out of m minus n i plus n minus 1 minus 1. And that's stored in in element n i of p n i. Okay, so I run this, um, and I had a bug already. I called the I called that n one. So let's correct that. So we call it n i here. This this. So the loop runs. Then you know this array of all the NIs is generated. So I can plot it and look at it. Um, so let's see where it went. Here. Uh, window figure. Oops, yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the result. Make Let me make the line a bit thicker, put some dots for the data points, etc. So it's something that decays kind of the higher, um, higher occupations are less probable. It makes sense, right? You have fewer number of ways of putting all of them in one, for example than distributing them in a kind of more, more democratic way. So it turns out that this fits very nicely to, to an exponential decay. So, so let me do a fit 
of this data, which is just p, and we, we can do an exponential fit, right? So the form of the so these are these run from one to to m, right? One to fifty in this case. That's the p we just calculated from that. Um, that binomial coefficient, the ratio of those binomial coefficients, and it's a pretty good fit um, to an exponential form. So here b is minus 0.17, for example. Okay. Um, I can maybe change my m, kind of increase the energy. So let's do m equal, I don't know, 60, right? And then we can run the same thing again. Now let's do the fit again. P. Again, an exponential fit is pretty good. And this is like uh, minus 14. So it's a negative number whose absolute value is a little bit smaller as we increase the temperature. Uh, so it turns out that there is uh, there is this thing called the Boltzmann distribution where one identifies this coefficient here with some number times inverse temperature. And and it seems to work pretty well, at least in this example. So Boltzmann uh, distribution says that the the probability of being in some microstate with energy En is given by some number times e to the minus En over kBT. It has an exponential dependence on the energy and the coefficient of this exponential uh, here is proportional to the inverse um, inverse temperature. So this is one of the fundamental kind of laws of, of statistical mechanics. Okay. So let's uh, push this and find some of the consequences. So first, um, you know, what is this constant? So we know that sum of all probabilities must be one, right? So sum over, let's say, n of p e n, which I can write as sum over n, a e to the minus e n over k b t. By the way, k b is known as a Boltzmann constant. Must be 1. So I can factor out the n, right? So that means that a times this sum is 1. And that means a is just 1 over that sum. OK. So rewriting this p of e n becomes e to the minus e n over k b t divided by sum over n e to the minus e n over k b t. Okay, so how do I find the the average energy, for example, right at at a higher temperature? Let let's gain a little bit of intuition about like what this k is. So if k is zero, right? Basically, like this coefficient in front of EN goes to infinity. So basically, we're not going to get, we're going to get zero probability unless the energy is zero. So it's going to be very sharp decay. Oops, decay to zero. 
Ah, come on. We'll go this way. So this is low temperature. So this is consistent with just occupying the ground state, the lowest energy state at zero temperature. And then as you increase the temperature, we're going to do something like this, right? So this is higher. If the temperature goes all the way up to infinity, basically like all energy levels become equally likely. Okay, so to find the average energy, well, each of these is <clears throat> the probability of a state having that energy. Um, so average energy I can write as, well, for each of them, so I sum over all the levels, there could be degeneracy. So this is not sum over energies, but sum over states, right? Take the, take, an hyd take a hydrogen atom, for example, right? The energy just depends on the principal quantum number, but each of those is, has some multiple degeneracy because you have various angular momentum quantum numbers. So we have to sum over all the states uh, and then for each kind of right the energy that that depends on that and it could be that some of these energies are are the same which is the case when you have degeneracies in your spectrum times um p of en okay so this is equal to again a sum over n Look, this sum doesn't depend on En, right? It's the denominator is already summed over all of them, so I can factor it out of the sum. And then in the numerator, I have a sum of En times e to the minus En over kBT. So that's a very, uh, very important relationship. Um, in in statistical mechanics, um, a very useful definition here uh, is to define a, a quantity known as the partition function. z which is just equal to that denominator there so it's sum over n e to the minus e n over kbt uh, a common notation is to call one over kbt um, to call it beta that's like an in inverse temperature um, so z can also then with this notation be written as sum over n e to the minus beta en now you notice that this denominator this numerator here in the average energy uh, is minus a derivative of z with respect to beta right so basically dz d beta is going to be sum over n and in each of these terms of the exponential uh, the derivative of the exponential is the same as the exponential and the derivative of minus beta e n with respect to beta is minus e n so it's going to be this so this gives us this very useful relationship that uh, basically the average energy is minus the derivative with respect to beta of the partition function divided by the partition function. Okay.
So let's go back to this example we started with, the one with a bunch of harmonic oscillators. Um, and let's see if we can calculate the average energy and relate it to this m quantity, right? We had this notion that, or, or rather connect the, the temperature to this m quantity. Um, we had a notion that higher temperature meant larger m, right? More average excitations. So how can we do that? Well, uh, I can try and calculate the average energy from the, the Boltzmann distribution and, and the partition function, right? So in this case, so going back to the harmonic oscillator example, En is n h bar omega naught. And then our partition function becomes sum over n equal, let's say, zero to infinity, right? You can, you can go all the way up to infinity, as many excitations as you want. Um, of e to the minus um, beta and h bar omega naught. So this is a geometric series, right? So if you I call e to the minus beta h bar omega naught, if I call it, I don't know, call it x, this is going to be 1 plus the first term for n equal, that's where 1 is for n equals 0, then for n equal 1, I get x. For n equal 2, I get x squared, x cubed, up to infinity. So this geometric series becomes 1, where 1 minus x. So z for this particular problem of, of a bunch of um, harmonic oscillator excitations is equal to uh, 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega naught, right? Again, beta is 1 over uh, k Boltzmann times temperature. All right, so let's find the average energy. So that's the expression for the average energy. So what I can do is to take the derivative with respect to beta of this. All right, so what is it going to be? Well, it's 1 over some function, so it becomes minus 1 over that function squared. Times the derivative of this function. Derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of minus uh, e to the minus beta h bar omega is going to be... Um, h bar omega, right? I get a factor of minus h bar omega naught when I take the derivative, but there's a minus sign up front times um, e to the minus beta h bar omega naught. All right. So. So I can write the average energy. Remember this general expression that we found is minus that derivative over z. So minus kills this, minus sign. So I have h bar omega naught e to the minus beta h bar omega naught divided by 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega naught quantity squared divided by z which gives me this factor in the numerator over 1. Um, and that cancels one of these factors. So, <clears throat> so this becomes h bar omega naught e to the minus. Um, so relating this to m and n, right, uh, 
we had a total energy that was h bar omega naught times n, and we had n oscillators. So the average energy of an oscillator can be written as h bar omega naught times m over n. Okay, so so from here I can basically now extract my temperature in terms of m and n, right? For for that system of um, oscillator. So how can we do that? Well, I can write. So I set this equal to that. So so h bar omega naught cancels out. Uh, I invert them. So e to the beta h bar omega naught minus one is going to be now n over m. So, therefore, e to the beta h bar omega naught becomes 1 plus n over n. And you take the log of this, and let me now go back to the kbt notation. So, h bar omega naught over kbt becomes the log, natural log of 1 plus n over n. And therefore, kbt is h bar omega naught over this law. Okay. So that's how you can kind of relate the, the temperature um, to um, to the total energy, if you wish. And of, and of course, if you have a higher temperature, uh, you get a higher um, temperature, right? So here, see, if M goes up, right, this number, the argument of log goes down, so it gets closer um, to... Um, to one, right? It's getting smaller. So, so log is getting smaller and the inverse of log is getting larger. Okay. Now, minus beta h bar omega naught. 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega naught. And I can multiply the denominator and the numerator by this exponential. So I get h bar omega uh, e to the plus beta h bar omega naught minus 1. All right, so to review, uh, basically like a quantum system, which can be anything, which can be just a solid with its, with all its electrons and, and nuclei, etc., cetera, uh, has an energy operator uh, stationary states correspond to Uh, eigenfunctions of that operator. So these are the stationary states. These are stationary energies. And then temperature basically tells us what kind of a statistical mixture of of these states we're in so there is there is some quantum uncertainty due to the fact that you know the wave function itself only tells about the probability and then on top of that if you're at finite temperature you have um, some kind of classical statistical probability for being 
in, in any of these stationary states. So at zero temperature, we realize the ground state, lowest energy stationary state, at finite t, we have the probability given by the Boltzmann weight which is e to the minus beta e n the energy of that level divided by z the partition function which is just some of those things so sum of all probabilities is zero so this is really the basis of of quantum statistical mechanics and if you think about any material at some finite temperature in equilibrium at some finite temperature um, pretty much everything we need to know about it is encoded in this quantity partition function as you saw for example we can calculate the average energy just from uh, taking the derivative of the partition function with respect to beta so so somehow knowing the, the spectrum uh, of the Hamiltonian, knowing all these energy levels, uh, can, can allow us to determine the thermodynamic properties of our system. So I think that's a good place to stop this lecture and, and this course. And this, this is, of course, a one-credit course. It's just to give you a flavor of some, some ideas in modern physics that serve as a basis for for the physics of materials and solids and for chemistry uh, in general. And as you can see, despite the, the huge complexity of, of nature and of condensed matter physics, um, a lot of things just boil down or stem from very simple equations. These equations are simple to write. They're quite impossible to solve for a complex system of many many electrons and then that that's really the the, the where the research comes in to find approximate ways uh, to understand this but at a fundamental level the description just boils down to the schrodinger equation and uh, if you want to talk about finite temperature the Boltzmann weight tell us about the probabilities um, of, of being in the, these different stationary states. All right, that's the end of uh, the course.